Hello folks, hope you are having a chilled out, chilled out Friday. It is the end of the week, so please wind down. Don't be pushing yourself too hard towards the weekend. If you like what I do, the subscribe button is down below, the Patreon button is also down below, and if you want to be involved in the prize draw next week, then, or is it next week? Is next week the start of July? No, the week after. If you want to be involved in a prize draw in a couple of weeks, then all you need to do is be a part of the Patreon at any level or a member of the channel. So that means you're helping the channel beyond just watching the videos. And if you do that, then you're entered into the prize draw with the top prize being £50 worth of models from Composite Games. Wherever you are in the world, look on their catalogue, see what you'd like, and then if you win, let me know. And if they can't get it to you because you're in somewhere weird like New Zealand or Australia or somewhere like that, that I will get it sent to me, and I will send it to you directly from me, maybe with a little note thanking you for supporting the channel. We'll see. I may even throw one or two goodies in there for if, if I have to send it to you. We will see. Anyway, hope you're all doing well. Let's crack on with some hobby nightmares, shall we? And also, if you're going to buy any models in the next few weeks, make sure you do support Composite Games, because they are the ones providing the prizes for the prize draws. And we need to help out smaller stores. Because God knows Games Workshop aren't. All right, Hobby Nightmares. Uh, Anthony says, Hey North, here's a sad Dreadnought story. I was getting back into playing 40k, but this time the hobby had managed to catch the interest of my friend group at large. Before long, we were all talking about why Space Marines blasting Xenos scum to bits was the coolest thing ever, as well as other endless discussions about the lore. One of my friends agreed that Dreadnoughts were epic. There's an awesome bit in the Dawn of War intro where one grabs an orc and breaks its spine and then slams it into the ground. Just amazing, and it sparked the imagination. When we finally got around to playing games together, I think we had a built-up expectation that the Dreadnought in particular would get up to some really cool shit. Yeah, um, Dreadnoughts have always been one of them flattering to deceive models, units, right? <laughs> They've always been that way. They've always been absolutely amazing in, in lore and in, uh, in in videos and things like that and, and video games, but like in the actual game itself, they're slow, they're ponderous, and essentially for a lot of um, editions of 40k, they were literally mobile weapon platforms which were quite tough to kill. Like, that was it. They, weren't do, they didn't do much else. Which is why I loved the Furioso Dreadnought. It was my favourite kind of Dreadnought. Just the fact that you can turn that thing, or used to be able to anyway, turn that thing into a blender and just send it at people was was lovely i loved it so furioso dreadnought to where it's at that's that, that's the good stuff our first mistake was that we'd often all try to play together it in a 2v2 free-for-all or something we didn't want to leave anybody out with the goal being we'd all have fun together the reality is that you'd spend way more of the game standing around as now you have to wait for three people to have their turn not just one it's a bad idea for beginners, or anyone. I've now decided I'm not that much of a fan of bigger games like this. Well, if you've got four people, why don't you just play 1v1s? Unless there's no space. We had one of these bigger 2v2 games planned, and my friend was bringing his Dreadnought. He ended up on the team against mine. Turn 1. My 10 Orc Tank Busters move into position. They see Dreadnought. They shoot Dreadnought. Dreadnought explodes. Immediately. Yeah, well, well they are tank busters, man. That's what they're there for. I think we were both a bit disappointed. I think I feel like I had made some horrible mistake and wanted to start over or at least read the rules again. My friend took it well and said he would. He, we should still continue. Unfortunately, the way 2v2s go, he only ended up with a few space marines and his chaplain to play with by the time his turn came around. Not to mention, the rest of the game took forever yeah i know man like that's happened to me a few times that has happened to me a few times like it happened to me at university i, I did quite well with the with the gray knights at university like i'd win quite a lot of games which also meant that i created quite a lot of salty players within my within my gaming group and so when we actually did our christmas apocalypse game you know uh, the, the, all of the enemies targeted my gray knights and all of my allies refused to help me because you know They'd all lost to me as well at some point during the year. Wasn't a very nice group, to put it mildly, but moving on. I think it was at this moment I realised I don't like playing 40k to win. 
It was as if so much storytelling potential had been wiped off the face of the earth when the Dreadnought was destroyed. That's a really good way of looking at it, dude. You would be such a cool player to play against, honestly. It, I, it didn't get to pulverize any of my orcs into paste or make some kind of heroic last stand. It was just dead. It may as well have not have been there. What utter, utter rubbish. Right, okay, well. Again, it's a dice game, though. So when the... If the here's the thing. I agree, but if cool happens, if cool moments happen every single time you do anything, then they would start to lose their meaning. The fact that they're randomly happening is the thing that gives them that credence of, oh my god, you'll never guess what just happened, you know? Because if it happens all the time, they'll say, well, I have something epic, I guess, you know? So yeah, it can't happen all the time, but I get what you're saying. Since then, I have tried to set up games with more narrative focus. I want to maximise the amount of cool moments possible. It doesn't go perfectly all the time, but I feel the less gamey I can make our battles, the better. Now that I've played many games, I've seen... I, I've been hoping to create some kind of campaign made of smaller battles. The idea of doing that will help build some kind of history, as our characters will be able to hold grudges against each other, and other cool things like that. Plus, it might help everyone feel involved if they're a part of a bigger narrative. In your experience, what's the best way to plan one of these things? Some kind of system with a map would be really cool. I'm struggling a little to figure out exactly the campaign game outside each, uh, outside each battle would work. Thanks for everything. Okay, cool. So, um, I would say uh, developing the lore of a, of a star system would be good. So having several planets there. Uh, making a small map for each of the several planets with quadrants on them that people are fighting over, like sectors and things like that, and have that. Just do that. So every single battle you win, you take over a sector. You know. So if the sectors that are neutral, two people fight over it. That that the winner colours in that sector. And for each sector you get, you get like a special. Um, you get like a a special kind of buff to your units. You can do an orbital bombardment, or you can do you know something like that goes on. That'd be pretty cool. Now, that's what I would do. So you, so you get like uh, more rounds of ammunition, so you can actually you can fire twice in a round or something like that. I don't know, but that's how I would do it. That is how I would do it. Tao Jack says, "Greetings, exiled Northman. I appreciate you reading my last story about the Tao player who tried to bully me out of the hobby in my first game of 40k, and I apologise for taking so long to write in with another story." Worry not, though, as I have returned with another nightmare of an apocalyptic scale. Today's tale begins in a different game store from the last story. A store that was my home away from home for the better part of three years, and is where I met some great friends and had some of the best hobby experiences of my life so far. But it had also been home to many a hobby nightmare over my time of playing there. I had been gaming at the store for about a year at this point, and had made friends with a lot of the local community and workers at the store. Because of this, I was invited to join in on a large apocalypse scale game that was going to be happening at the store the following week. It was going to be about 20 people playing 2,000 points per player. There were two teams for the battle. What, 20 people? 20,000 points? Really? No, 40,000 points. What am I doing? This is why I'm an historian and not a, not a, a mathematician. There were two teams for the battle. That being the forces of the Imperium on one side and the forces of the Xenos slash Chaos on the other. The initiative for this match was going to be determined in a unique way, with each team putting out a time frame agreed upon by the players on the team. To deploy their models, whoever finished deployment the fastest would win first turn. However, if your team went over the time limits at all, they would go second. The Chaos slash Xenos team were determined to go first and, after a decent amount of arguing, decided they would deploy their units in a five minute time frame. Our team, the Imperials, decided that our forces were sturdy enough to weather the storm and would rather take our time making sure we deployed our units correctly and elected to have our time frame for deployment be 40,000 years. Stupid joke, I know. This shook up the enemy team a little, as they had to work with their short five minute time frame, but when the clock started, they began quickly deploying their forces. This is where the first issue began. On their team was a fairly infamous Tau player in the community, 
One known for forgetting his rules, forgetting what units he'd fired already, or even sometimes blatantly cheating in games until he was asked to pull out his rulebook to show the correct ruling for whatever nonsense he was trying to pull. To the surprise of our team, the Xenos and Chaos players managed to place their units on the board within five minutes. All except for the Tau player. He was scrambling back and forth to another, to another room where he had left the majority of his army because he didn't feel like bringing them into the main hall when we were having the match. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. As he ran to get his last unit, the timer went off and the team was furious. Well, to be fair, to be fair, haven't they already given up first turn? Is that how it works? Oh, I guess... Right, I guess, like, you guys don't mind if you go first. So you say we'll deploy in 40,000 years. Fair enough. But if you don't beat five minutes, because they did five minutes, then you then you go second. I understand. Right, okay, cool. Excellent. But because they've now lost their five minutes, they now have to go second. Oh my god, and you guys get to deploy as slowly as you like. Now this guy was already not well liked in the community due to his previously mentioned habits, but now he had cost his whole team the first round lead they were determined to have. An eruption of yelling and arguing came from their entire team as they bombarded this poor guy for his screw-up to the point where he just looked at his friend on the, on the team, another Tau player, and told him to control his army for the match, and then left the store for the day. Wow, I really feel for that guy. Wow. That's horrible. That is horrible. Like, it's a game, guys. You know, it's, it's, it's... I understand when something unfair happens, but, you know, it's a game. At the end of the day, right, if someone's cheating or, or being a bad sport, fair enough. That, that, that's something to be lambasted over. If somebody makes a mistake and it costs your team, if it's just a game, dude, get on with it. Just, just back that guy up, you know, hopefully he won't do it again. If he keeps doing it, then yeah, say, look, you know, you're, you're, that problem's causing us problems. Please don't do that, you know. But hey. I still feel bad for the guy to this day. He may have been a scummy player, but that was too much. This meant, though, that we were given first turn, and oh boy, was, was it a turn. Heavy weapons opened up across the several tables we had connected into one massive battlefield, obliterating Xenos and, Her and Heretics alike. My ally to the left engaged his Ultramarines forth into a horde of Zinch demons and Alpha Legion warriors, while supported by my tanks and Katajan jungle fighters. To my right, our Space Wolf player rushed forward towards a force of World Eaters in what was sure to be a fierce melee that would be spoken of for centuries. On the left-hand table, though, well, that was a different battle. A battle of two other problem players. The one, well, the one from my enemy team was an Orc player, and a rare one at that due to his short and explosive temper. Rather than the incredibly pleasant vibe of most Orc players. Yeah, most Orc players are dudes, man. Most Orc players are, are, are chill dudes. They're really nice guys. Very rarely do I get to say that about an entire fan base normally, but yeah, most Orc guys are um, really chill, really cool. Until they start shouting wah every single time they do something cool. That gets annoying, but aside from that, you know. This one man lost the game with a demon army of his and was so pissed that he packed his army up, left the store, and threw the entire army into a nearby river. What? Now picture this man facing off against our team's problem player. This player was a particularly big fan of knights, but not just knights, but Forge World knights. This took place during a period in 8th edition where knights in general were very strong, but Forge World knights were very, very powerful. And this man loved to play them as powerful force he could, and liked to gloat whenever he'd wipe out a player's force. Imagine, if you will, the look on the orc player's face as his two squigoths were immediately blasted off the table in a single shooting phase by one or two knights. He was not a happy man, but to his credit, he didn't blow up the knight player in, the, in the knight player's face. Instead, he simply grumbled to himself, packed up the rest of his army, and stormed out of the store. His team on that side, now abandoned by their orc companion, was, was free game for the rest of the knights and other players on that side of the table. Wow. Wow. If you've just lost two Squigoths and you've got like four, like 2,000 points of Orcs there or 4,000 points of Orcs there, dude, grow up. Grow up. 
I know that's like a sizable quarter of your army, but come on. You know? Don't leave your friends in the lurch. The battle waged on as his forces on both sides began to take losses. The Space Wolves charging into a Lord of Skulls and destroying it in melee, only to have it explode and obliterate most of his Space Wolf forces. I diverted my fire to, to deal with the still uh, present World Eaters threat after, after having weakened much of the Zinch Demon's forces in front of me as the Ultramarines player pressed on against the Alpha Legion player. This is where the last nightmarish part of the story occurs. The Alpha Legion player wasn't a part of our regular gaming community, but was, but was someone invited from out of town by another player at the game. This player had a lot of proxy models, which is kind of on point for Alpha Legion, I guess, which our, which our game store was very lenient on as long as they were about the right size for what they were proxying. We cared more about fun than the rules. Now, this guy had a few models that were basically just naked anime girls. One in particular seemed to be his favourite. Oh, no. No, no, no. You, you're not playing at my store with your little weeaboo bullshit. Get out. This was his demon prince, which in reality was just a giant anime girl with a big sword and brightly painted nipples. <sighs> the ultramarine player had managed to cut down the forces nearby the demon prince and decided that it would be his last target. Alpha Legion player didn't like that very much and began to argue how much he shouldn't shoot her and how they were much more viable targets. The Ultramarine player... Yeah, don't try and reason logic with an Ultramarine player. If the Codex Astarte says that thing's going to die, he's going to try and kill it. There's no talking in him out of it. That's just how his brain is structured. The Ultramarine player cared not and vaporized the heretic filth from a distance with a volley of fire and some solid dice rolling. This, on top of his argumentative and diminishing team, caused the Alpha Legion player to pack up his things and depart the store as well. The story, unfortunately, doesn't have an exciting or explosive ending, but the battle soon began to die down. My forces managed to finish off the last of the Zinch and World Eaters forces, while a veteran squad I had in a Valkyrie diverted to the leftmost tables to help with an Orc player who was stubbornly putting up a fight. The Valk was shot down, but the squad survived and joined our forces to that side, laying Gimson some supporting fire to wipe up the Xenos. That's how an Orc player plays, by the way. He wants a good fight, so he fights to the end. If you're, if you're a, an Orc player and both of your Squigoths die, that's hilarious. Pack up your shit and keep fighting. Move forwards. Don't just leave the venue. Don't be a little bitch. To the far right table, the Tau player, with two armies worth of Tau, was putting up a surprisingly solid fight against our Cadian and Dark Angels players on that side. I began to lend some aid by hurling a few artillery shells from my basilisks into the Tau forces. That's cool. The combined effort finishing them off and won the day for the Imperium. The remaining players in the game all claimed to have a good time and enjoyed playing in such a massive battle. But this is where our story ends. I hope you enjoyed it and if you're interested I have a very long tale of action adventure, a, a month-long narrative campaign and the story of how one guardsman in my regiment proved himself time and again in heroic deeds until he became the commander of my army. All with a good amount of hobby nightmares mixed in, including one where I was the problem player in a moment I still cringe about to this day. Ooh, send me that one. Hope you have a good one. Until next time, Jack. Okay, send me that one. That'd be pretty cool. Alrighty, let me take a quick sip of tea and we'll carry on. Alright, here we go. Uh, Yancey says, Hey, deported up north. Hello. It's Yancey again. Thanks for reading my previous submissions. I'm glad you and the community get some enjoyment out of them. I've been a hobbyist for almost two decades, so I have a ton of nightmares. And when I have time, I'll try to keep writing them in. Yeah, do so. I'm also sorry about to hear about the medical issues going on with the grandfather. I went through a hard time myself with one of my grandfathers, so I can relate. No problem, man. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, it's never easy, but I genuinely hope it all subsides and gets better. For what it's worth, I'm rooting for you. Cheers, man. You're a legend. The nightmare I wanted to share takes place a few years ago. I had a good friend who we'll refer to as Hal. We met during uh, we met working at a retail store and, de and due to shared nerddom, we quickly hit it off. Almost every day after work, we would hang out. We started off drinking and playing video games, but soon found out we had both had a shared interest in wargaming and D&D. It didn't take long for Hal to invite me to his D&D campaign to meet his cronies. 
everybody played with the right balance of focus, socialising and genu gen generally goofing off. This was awesome, the perfect gaming vibe for me, and something I look forward to every day, every Friday when I got off work. Now, around the same time, we had a colleague at work who wanted to start hanging out with us. We'll call her Larissa. Now, she didn't show much interest in things like D&D, so Hal and I would hang out at bars with her. Larissa was super fun to be around, but over time became more and more of a flirtatious person. I decided I would ask her out. Ah, shoot your shot, man. Yeah, good lad. Given the fact she seemed to flirt with both of us, I decided to have a one-on-one -on -one chat with Hal first, just to clear the air. That bro behaviour, good. He said he found her attractive, but I should go for it, and he wouldn't get in the way. He and I agreed that we valued our friendship and didn't want something stupid to ruin it. That's good, good lads. Good lads. They're knights of the road there. Good lads. All right. Larissa and I went on our first date, so she said yes. Good. And as far as I could tell, it went really well. That is except for one moment at the end of the date when I went in for a kiss. She stiffened up her old body like a plank. She didn't say no, and I was mid-motion, not sure what to do. So I gave her a peck on the lips instead, and told her to have a great night. She didn't say anything in response, and just went back inside of her house. I thought, okay, awkward. Though I didn't want to hold that against her, what was otherwise, and what was otherwise, a great night. Okay. <clears throat> Only thing I can think of there, is maybe she, she, uh, she didn't have as much of a good night. But if, she, if that was the case, she should have stopped you and said, listen, do you mind if we just be friends? That'd be fine. That's not a problem. But uh, yeah, to do what she just did there seems a little bit... It kind of makes me think that she that she kind of wanted to, but w isn't used to it. So she flirts and doesn't expect it's ever going to get acted on. So when you act on it, she goes like, Oh my god, shit! Right? Let, let's see if that's the case. I met up with Hal and crew later that night for our D&D session. Gave them the details to which everybody was super supportive of and said not to worry about it. It was nothing. The next day, I walk into work slightly hungover and greeted by practically every employee in the building giving me the cold shoulder and shameful stares. Oh god. I tried to question people as to why the hell they're giving me that look. The only responses I got were a lot of, how could you? Uh, she, you know what she's done? She's gone in there. She's not enjoyed the date. So she's gone in there and she's, she's slandered you to everybody saying that you did weird shit when you didn't. I bet you. Officially weirded out, I spot Larissa and make my way over to say hi. She spots me and runs. Later, when I bump into her to try and talk, she won't say a single word. Eventually, a stoner co-worker tells me that she claimed I was stalking her. There we go. This royally pisses me off. I try to talk to Larissa one last time to just clear the air, but Larissa's silent treatment continues on. I just decided to say, fuck it, and not worry about it. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. If they say... <clears throat> okay. I have a lot of female friends, right? I'm quite lucky to have a lot of female friends. Um, almost all of them are single, and almost all of them bemoan the fact that there are no good men around. This is why. This is why. There are plenty of two. There are there are two points to this, right? <clears throat> okay. One will be more harsh than the other. Number one, there are plenty of good men around. They're just terrified of approaching you because shit like this happens. You can say anything, and people would instantly believe you. People will instantly take your side against us. We do not have a leg to stand on. It's like Pandora's box has been opened up. If you don't enjoy a date with us, or, or, or you have some sort of social anxiety about going on a date with us, so you feel some sort of shame about it, right? If you go to anybody around us and you tell them that, that we assaulted you, or we followed you, or we stalked you, or we touched you inappropriately without you asking, right? We're done. That social circle is now dead to us. And that's if you don't go to the authorities. If you go to the authorities, we are in jail. The police will turn up and throw us in jail. On suspicion that we did something a bit weird. On suspicion. Now, most of the lads in this hobby are self-conscious, right? They are quite uh, down on themselves and they're a bit socially awkward. So, they can come across at times as being creepy when they're not. They're just socially awkward. So all the girls in the hobby do not blame men for you being single, right? 
Blame the people who make false accusations as to why you're single in the hobby. Because every single man I, who I know is terrified of approaching a woman in the hobby just in case they get their name slandered to everybody else in the hobby. Okay? That's why you're single. That's why you don't find any good men. Because they're all terrified of you and, you know, most of them think you're too much trouble. They'd rather just spend time with their friends. You're, 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 too much, you're more trouble than you're worth, I'm afraid. And the more you grow up and the more you get used to the opposite sex, I'm telling you guys, you will realise there is a lot of inner peace in just sitting down with your friends and playing a few video games or going out for a few pints with your mates. There's a lot of inner peace there and women seem to bring a hell of a lot of issues to your life that you don't fucking need, okay? When you meet the ones who don't do that now and add to your life, put a fucking ring on it. Keep them around, treat them like queens, and make sure they don't leave. Because those are the ones, I don't care what she looks like, dude. I don't care what she looks like. If you find a woman who sets your brain on fire, and sticks around, and is, and is a ride or die person, and loves your hobbies, and loves you having time to yourself with your friends, doesn't drive you up the wall, and actively adds to your life, slap a fucking ring on it. I don't care if your last girlfriend was a straight 10, and this girl's a 6 or a 7. Put a fucking ring on it and take it down the aisle, dude. Or at least make sure that she never leaves. Because that's the girl who's going to give you a happy, fulfilling life. Go and do it. Alright, that's my... Oh, and the second part, right? The second part. This is the more harsh one. There are top quality men out there who earn six figures and, and, and who are into the hobby and, are, and look like Henry Cavill. The problem is, love, they don't want you because you're not on their level. Sorry, somebody had to tell you. It's what it is. You're not on their level. Sorry. You're not good looking enough. You're not cool enough. You're not on their level. I, I meet a lot of girls who seem to think that they are, you know, Hayley Atwell reborn. And they're not. You know, they're, they're average at best. Average at best. And they seem to expect and demand that a, that a Chad level 10 is what they deserve and i'm sorry guys like that will not go for you they will they will if they if they they will do anything at all they will sleep with you once and leave because you're not on their level fix yourself work on yourself if you want to be on their level work on yourself this is a meritocracy you get what you deserve most of the time and most dudes who are amazing looking and have really good jobs and are into the same hobbies as you will not be into you because they can have any woman they want any woman they want why would they go for you and the amount of women who, who, who say to me like like oh well, well i'm really good I, i'm really submissive things like that that's not what they want like i'm you, you're not seeing what i'm what i'm telling you right if this was me if I, as a man i'd be told to suck it up and get on with it go to the gym right so i'll say the same to you if you want a, a top level man get your ass to the gym lose the puppy fat right Get an attitude shift. Know what that guy wants and be what that guy wants. If you want that guy. Okay? Because that's what I would have to do. If I want to go out with a 10, right? That's what, As a man, that's what I would have to do. Go to the gym, have an attitude change. Be more humble. Work on my personality. Work on talking to, to women. Work on getting a sense of humour. Right? I would have to do all of those things. So why should it be any different for you? Top class men don't want to be with you because you're not on their level. Sorry, just this what it is. Moving on. So, <clears throat> a month passes and I host a party at my house. I invite over the cool people from work and get a good turnout of about 20 people. About halfway into the night of socialising and playing drinking games, I get a knock at the door. Okay. It's Hal who showed up late, and Larissa is with him. I have, I, have lo I have a lot of trust in Hal's character, and I want to give him the benefit of the doubt, so I let them both in and don't say anything. As the night goes on, I notice the two of them being flirtatious, and Hal acting guilty. Dude, okay, I'm going to stop you here. I'm going to stop you here. If your friend, quote-unquote, knows what this bitch has said about you, and turns up to your house party with her... That's not your friend. Kick them both to the fucking curb and get them both in the fucking sea. They deserve each other. If this is my house, I say, what the fuck is she doing here? And what the fuck are you doing with her? 
If he says, oh, 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 no, 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 you're thinking with your penis. This is small dick behavior. She's manipulating you and she's going to ruin part of your life just like she tried to ruin mine. Either get her gone and come in here and have pints with your friends or fuck off with her to wherever the fuck fucking hole she lives in and stay there. That's what you should have said. I probe the two of them by bringing over some drinks and invite them to play beer pong. Again, dude. Again. Larissa still refuses to, to, uh, to talk to me. Dude, it's your house. It's your house. Kick her the fuck out. If she doesn't want to talk to you, leave. This is my house. Leave. No surprise there. Hal thanks me for the drink, but declines to participate. Then you fuck off as well. Get out. I heavily suspect they're together. Then get them out your house, dude. I pull Hal aside in the hallway and bluntly tell him, I know you and Larissa are dating. A look of horror washes over his face. I tell him I don't care about the idea of them dating, that this doesn't make me jealous or anything. I explain to Hal that I care about him and I just want to warn him. I tell him that I went on a date and then she spread a lie about me stalking her. Oh, actually, we didn't know. Okay, fair enough. He unconvincingly thanks me, which pisses me off, because I can tell he doesn't believe me. Yeah, dude, uh, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I've had this as well. I've had this as well. Okay. So, I'm going to go into a personal story right now, and this is very personal. Right? So, so please don't be, you know, judging me or anything like that. So, let me have a sip of tea. So, back in the day, when I was in university... I was a bit of the lad about town, so I, I would kind of like shag around, and, and as you do in university, right? I wasn't as prolific as some of my man whore friends like, but uh, like I was very promiscuous. Like I, I'd, I'd, get, I'd get myself about. And I was older as well. I was 24 at the time, when most of the women around in university were like 18, 19, 20, you know. So it was like, cherry, pick what you want. I, I had an older head on my shoulders. They liked that, you know, and... Uh, Normally, I'd wait until they were, like, third years, so they were at least, like, 21, you know, 20, 21 before, like, I did anything. But anyway, so I went out with this girl who was a, a mature student. She was, an, she was, like, 31, I think, so a little bit older than me, and she was a bit promiscuous as well. She would sleep around, she, she would do a lot of stuff, and it would be fine. Okay, that's fine. One day, uh, we're, you know, doing the deed, and my protection breaks and then the protection I'm using snaps. Oh dear, right? And so I pull out, I stop, I say, look, we have to stop, uh, it's, it's snapped, you know, I'm gonna go get a shower, I'm gonna just go to bed. She said, okay, no problem, that's fine. So we went to bed, no problem. Okay. Next day, everything's fine, I walk her home, whatever. A few days later, I start to develop symptoms of something being not quite right with me. So, I go and I text her and I said, look, um, I've got symptoms of something. And by this time, I'm only sleeping with this girl, by the way, right? I've got the symptoms of something's not quite right with me. We need to go to the clinic and get this sorted out. Fair enough, right? Most dudes who've slept around have had a dose every, 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 at one stage in their lives. It happens. It's fine. So she blames me for this. She blames me and, and starts, you know, berating me. But we get down there. And the, I almost remember this really small but really cool Pakistani doctor he was so funny like he got me into the room and he went uh, you look like you're in pain oh sorry I'm gonna do this is gonna be so racist so please don't you know but I, I've, I've done this with I've done this with friends who are from that part of the world and they've all laughed like I've told the story a lot right uh, over a couple of pints so he goes you look like you're in pain and I was like yes I am a little bit yes it's burning quite a bit and he goes I'll be back in a second and he walks out and he uh, he does like a swab of me, goes goes away and comes back, and he literally sticks his head in and just says, "Someone's been a naughty, naughty boy." And I was like, "Just just give me the fucking pills, please." So he comes in and go, and he tells me what it is. I'm not going to tell you what it was. It wasn't anything serious, but I, I, it, it wasn't anything life threatening or serious. But it was it was annoying. It was an irritant of a, of of an illness essentially. And he said, um, "Listen, uh, I'm going to give you a shot, and it will clear right up. No no problem." So he takes my pants down. He says, um, I'm going to give you this on three. I say, okay. He says, one, and then sticks it right in. <laughs> sticks it right in. Gives me the full injection. 
And I swear to God, as soon as he injected it, all of the pain nearly went away. It was it was nearly instantaneous. It was very very cool. Um, so he said, you know, go home, boil wash all your clothes, boil wash your bedding, all that sort of stuff. And I said, why? Like, that she's the only girl who's been in there, and it was my problem. I need to wash it, you know. Like, uh, do we need to wash all of my clothes? And he said, he said, this is what he said. Anything she's touched, wash. I was like, what? He said, no, listen. What you have is symptomless, right, in women. As soon as men get this, they develop symptoms the next day, almost, right? So it's symptomless in women, but men, as soon as they get it, they've got it. Uh, and and it, it's, it's, you know. So, that's why I said it's not my fault then. He said, no, it's not. It's not. It's not your fault. <clears throat> like, you need to have a t talk with this girl and, you know, you know, make sure you, this is right for you because if you're together together, she's got this from somewhere else. And we weren't together together. We were just, we were just shagging, right? We weren't together together. So we walked out and I told her. I said, look, you know, this wasn't cool. I nearly messaged all of my exes telling them that I had something wrong with me so they needed to go and get checked. Now I knew I didn't need to do that. But she had been guilting me and telling me I needed to do this all day. So I was like, you, you, there must have been some part of you that knew this was your fault. Because the amount of shagging around you've been doing. She lied and lied and lied, telling me that she hadn't been shagging around, doing all that stuff. I've got scientific proof that this is what you've been doing. Like, stop it. We're done. And I walked off. I dumped her and I walked off. I said, no, no more. No more sex from me. Thank you. I walked away. Years later, right, uh, my friend notices this person on my Facebook group, on my, on my Facebook page. And that she's been, you know, leaving stuff on my on my Facebook, like a you know comments here and there. Happy comments, you know, trying to get back in there, sort of a thing. So we're going for a pint, and he's in one hell of a dry spell. And he says, "Look, do you mind if I, um, you know, dip my wick a bit? Do you mind if I I, I ask her out?" And I was like, "Yeah, fine." I'm, but I will warn you, like she's in, she's insane, and you know this is what happened to me with her. So wear something on the end of it. Don't be, you know, don't be silly. And if it snaps, immediately go and get yourself tested. You know, I wouldn't if I were you, but yeah, sure, there's her number, right? So, he said, fine, thank you very much. He went, and of course, they, they, they slept together, had a really good time, whatever. And um, she tells him that it was me who gave stuff to her. Even though she knows full well, that's not what happened. And worse still, whenever he came back and he told me, he said, he said oh, well, she said that you that you gave it to her. He said it as in, like, He's caught me in a lie or something. And I was and to this day, to this day, I don't trust this guy around around women because every single time there's a woman around, he takes their side in arguments. He laughs at all of their jokes. He can't get enough of them. And he will he will literally throw you under a fucking bus if there's pussy involved. Literally. And that's the first time when that really came home to me. I was like, listen, um, I trust you in a lot of ways. You're a really cool dude, you're like a brother to me. But when, when there's a woman around, you are not dependable. You break omerta. You break bro code very, very, very easily. And I don't like that. So, no. Like, like I, I don't trust you around women. That's the one thing I'm drawing a line on, right? You can go out and try and pull women on your own because I, I won't do it with you. Because you can't be trusted. There, there's no... I can't, I can't guarantee I'm going to get home safely. Because if I drink too much, right, and you meet a woman... You will choose to go home with that woman over getting me home safely. You break omerta. You break bro code. You're a simp, and I don't want to be around it when we go out. That's it. You either go out and drink without pulling women, or we don't go out at all. And, you know, this guy seems... This Hal guy seems incredibly like that. You do not do shit like this as a bro. You clear it with your bros first. Exactly what this guy did first. He cleared it with Hal first. He said, listen, I know you like this girl as well. Do you mind if I take a crack at her? Fine. Hal should have come back and done exactly the same with you. And even more so, he should believe you when you warn him. A lot of dudes tend to think you're just bitter because I've got a woman you couldn't get. And I was the same with, with, my, with my friend. I was like, we, we had this discussion. I said, dude, I gave you that fucking woman. I threw her in front of you. Like a body out of a moving car. Like, that's, this isn't, that you haven't, you haven't champed yourself up, you right? You, I threw you one, I, I threw you one of my discards. I threw you a bone. 
There you go. Right? If I, it's, just, it's just like in that movie. If I throw a dog a bone, I don't want to know if it tastes good or not. Eat it or don't. Right? That's what I mean. Do, do, don't, don't come back at me and try and say, oh, well, you know, I, I, I actually agree with her now because she's shagging you. Grow a pair. Grow a fucking pair. Same with this Hal. Believe your bros. Believe your bros. Yes, there are bitter bros out there, but if if your bro has no reason to lie to you about something, if you're on your dating a woman and he warns you about her, take his word as read. Stick together, kings, and kick her out. Pour her in the fucking bin and get her in the fucking sea. Anyway. <clears throat> We begin to argue. No shit. The conversation ended with me yelling at Hal, You don't get it. You're, you're Charla Nash, and this fucking bitch is Travis the Chimp. I don't know what that means. Hal grabs Larissa by the arm and storms out. Hal and I go radio silent for about a week until one day he asks to talk to me in private at work. Uh, I'm guessing he finds out that you're right. Hal, as Hal asks for forgiveness and just keeps repeating, You were so right. It turns out she started spreading a rumour that he was sexually harassing her. What a surprise! We both break full contact with, the, with Larissa, but it's worth mentioning that she continued this pattern with other victims at work. Yeah, this bitch is the reason why women aren't listened to that, cl that closely when they start saying that they were abused and things like that, you know? Bitches like this are the ones who make sure that real rape victims don't get listened to. Go fuck this woman, get her in the sea. Get her in the sea and keep her there. While you're down, she just drowns. Honest to God. Drowned at birth. That's what she should have been. My God. It, it, it's just so wrong on so many levels. On so many levels. You know, it's, it's, it's ultra harmful to men because there is no judge, no jury. We are literally tarred with that brush for the rest of our lives. And we lose entire friend groups because of it, right? Because of false accusations and also you're screwing up your other other women what, what, what if something happens to them <clears throat> in me i'm guilty of this by the way i'm guilty of this when a woman says something happened to me i'm instantly skeptical i'm instantly skeptical and i shouldn't be but i am because so so many lying bitches are out there who try and ruin people's lives for the sake of doing it because they get some sort of sick satisfaction out of it or they sleep with somebody and then regret it afterwards and start spreading rumors and start ruining people's lives we've seen it so many times with footballers over here when a girl will have a threesome with this happened a few years ago a girl had a threesome with two footballers right went back to their hotel room even on cctv cameras you can see she's not drunk she's fine she goes back to their hotel room has sex with both of them regrets it in the morning and accuses them of raping her right I'm sorry, it doesn't fucking wash. It, it can happen, don't get me wrong. It can happen. And probably does happen. Right? <clears throat> but those guys went through years of a court process before it, it was finally quashed. <clears throat> and she admitted, she admitted that she was lying the entire time. What happened to her? Nothing. Was she found in contempt of court? No. Was she dumped for perjury for lying in court? Which is a fucking crime, by the way. No. She was just let go. Just let go. No problem at all. Ruined two guys' lives for years. They lost marriages over this. The wives left them. You ruined two lives, right? For what? Get in the fucking sea. And yes, they did cheat on their wives. That, that was a shitty thing to do. But marriages do recover from that. You know, I'm sorry, but they do. I, I don't think they should, but they do. So that doesn't automatically mean they're going to get divorced. You know, you made that choice to go in there and you made that choice to do that. Own it. We've got to own it. Do the walk of shame like the rest of us. Don't ruin somebody's life. And by doing that, the thing that pisses me off the most, right? The thing that pisses me off the most, because those guys, let's be honest, they put themselves in that situation. They knew it was a bit of a risky situation. They knew they were married, all right? So on some level, you know, they deserved some sort of backlash, but not that, right? That's not really what pisses me off. That does piss me off because I'm a man. But that does, that's not the, the main reason it pisses me off. The main reason it pisses me off is that there are women out there who are going to suffer very real abuse. Very real abuse. And guys like me will look at them with a very sceptical eye when we shouldn't. 
And that fucking irks me. And the reason why we do that is because there's so many lying bitches out there doing shit like this. It annoys me. Don't lie about things like this. It ruins lives and it makes sure that women just like you will not be listened to going forwards. Especially in this hobby. Especially in as close-knit a hobby as this. Don't do it. Alright. This story is not all bad news though. About half a year goes by and Hal starts dating somebody new, who we'll call Ava. Ava and Hal are a perfect fit. She even decides to give D&D a shot and joins our campaign. Our campaign only went a few more sessions before coming to an epic conclusion. The shorthand version, I played a Minotaur who only spoke two languages. The first being the language of Cow, and the second being Abyssal, as my Minotaur was part of a cult. I was neutral evil, and valued power above all else. I sidekicked with another party member who was Dragonkin, he spoke Common and Abyssal. The rest of our party were all good aligned characters, so the Dragonkin was the only one who could, who could communicate with me, and we bummed around, uh, around as Rocket and Groot for most of our sessions. When it came time to team up with the wizard and help defeat a dragon that was terrorising the town, the Dragonkin and I instead made a pact with the dragon. We executed the wizard by surprise and battled our party and successfully killed them. Oh my god. We returned to the dragon and the campaign ended with us being showered with wealth and becoming his lieutenants. The ending to this campaign was so crazy and fun that Ava fell in love with D&D. To this day, Hal and, Eva are st Hal and Ava are still a couple, but congratulations to them. I, s I last saw Larissa on social media where it looked like she really let herself go. What a surprise. She took a dive off of the ugly tree. Part of me feels bad for her, but I guess her physical appearance finally caught up with what, what she looks like on the inside. Moral of the story, there's so many cool women out there. Don't chase after losers. Know your worth. Stay positive, fellas. Best regards, Yancey. Dude, that is an epic end to the tale. And that is true. Women who act like this, their looks always catch up with them in the end. The wall hits them smack bang in the face because every single guy they're with, they either ruin their lives or their friends steer the fuck clear of them. Do not act like this woman. Please. Please. Alright, I love you all a long time. I will speak to you uh, over the weekend, maybe, we'll see. And I've been thinking, for those of you who are here at the end, of uh, doing a charity stream on the day that I do the prize draw. So on the weekend I do the prize draw, doing a stream where all of your pro all of your donations in that stream will go to charity. I'm thinking about doing it around the 8th or the 9th of July, or the 1st or the 2nd maybe. Yeah, 1st or the 2nd of July would be good. So let me know if that's a good idea in the comment section down below. I love you all a long time. I will speak to you very, very, very soon. Have a wonderful rest of your day. See you later. Bye now.